you. This is Andrea Xenofondos. Today we'll be presenting on Alison Spray um, plays called Jeans, Hunter Hunter's Back. It is a relatively recent play, as you can see. I hope you have watched it. This is going to be a feminist discussion on my part. So this is my content. I'm going to start with a brief introduction. I'm going to go to radical feminism, which is uh, um, the theoretical background, then to political lesbianism. The term feminazia is being used in the play. Then some limitations, and of course my work cited. So this is the introduction. As you can see here is the Feminazi Five um, and the title of, uh, of the play. So the cast is comprised by five socially marginalized women who decide to take matters in their own hand and castrate men rapists. This is the cast. Uh, we have Petey, the lesbian, homeless girl in her teens. She lives both in the present, that is castrating men, and also in the future, that is interrogation room. She has been raped by a male friend of hers. Then we have Genevieve, also called Jinx. She's the leader of the feminazi group. She's very authoritative and she's manipulative and strongly opinionated. Amy is a prostitute girl. Her uncle is her pimp. Natasha is a black woman in her 30s. She's an illegal abortionist. Uh, and then Marie, which is a, she's a teen who has been a child porn star. She has now managed to hack the system of such websites and implant viruses. Now, on to radical feminism, a little bit of the theoretical background. It has been emerging, emerging in the 1960s and 70s. These feminists, they were no longer reformists, but they were rather revolutionaries. And they focused a lot on consciousness raising, something that we see in the play as well. They focus on the importance of sharing personal experiences among women, hence the personal becomes political, which is their motto. Uh, there is a lot of prominence given on sexuality and also on reproductive issues such as abortion. Abortion is something that is being raised in the play as, a, as an issue. When it comes to sexuality, it is a means to understand female oppression, and Jean's perspective is very important, we shall see that in a bit. Uh, they give a lot of emphasis on how women experience emotional oppression. The emotions are very important when it comes uh, to these women, and issues such as self-identity, self-worth become very important. And there's a very strong claim made by radical feminists that basically women's oppression is more fundamental than any other form of human oppression. Um, and indeed, this is a strong claim to make, and we shall see how it evolves. Now, uh, we're going to focus on radical culture of feminists because this is, you know, Jean's the perfect example of radical culture of feminists. She has a celebratory approach towards femininity. Lesbianism for her is the only way to escape male oppression. And she believes that female, females, although they come from different contexts, they share one female nature, which invokes the idea of women as being wolves. Um, now some quotations from Anne Ferguson. She wrote on radical culture of feminist beliefs on sexuality. They believe, and I quote, heterosexual sexual relations generally are characterized by an ideology of sexual objectification. That is, men are the masters and uh, women are the slaves that supports male sexual violence against women. And for them, patriarchal heterosexuality is beyond repair. It must be destroyed. So the idea is that um, basically heterosexuality kind of supports the patriarchal system and in itself is what perpetuates um, violence against women and basically reduces women to mere subjects, uh, objects. Now, uh, apart from Jean's perspective on heterosexuality, we have criticism on pornography. Here is Natasha, she talks with Marie about child pornography. She says, maybe they think it's okay because it's not real. And Marie replies, even if it isn't real, it makes light of what people like me have gone through. It makes it cute and sexy and fun, which is of course not. It dehumanizes women as, and perceives them as merely objects. Now, there's also emphasis given on the emotional experience of the victim, and here is pity. She describes how men feel once they're being castrated. I have underlined these passages just to give emphasis on the fact that women, these women, uh, they emphasize a lot on the need to take revenge and make men feel exactly how women felt once they were being raped. And I read, some of them go into shock or pass out from the stress, kind of like how women respond to being raped. They didn't come forward immediately, I guess they were scared or embarrassed. So instead, they whispered it between themselves. And that's when the men in our area started acting differently, less aggressive, more apologetic. And so did women, more free, more relaxed. Again, you know, the emphasis on feeling embarrassed, on feeling scared, of whispering it. I mean, I mean, isn't this how women react when they're being raped? Some of them do not even dare to whisper to themselves, not, not among them. 
Now moving on to political lesbianism, which is a term that was being um, invoked by Jeans. Here PD asks political lesbianism and Jeans replies, it's the idea that, uh, that our, our heterosexuality is forced on women as a means of isolating women from each other so that we can never effectively revolt against our male oppressors. The way to liberate oneself from that oppression is to choose to love women instead, to restore the bonds of sisterhood, find strength in numbers, and decolonize our minds of internalized misogyny. This is the perspective that James gives on political lesbianism. Ideally, is when women are not attracted to men, uh, they're not attracted to females, and they want to reorient their sexual desires towards women, uh, basically to create a political stance and go against the patriarchal system. Of course, it's a very strong claim to make. There has been criticism mainly by radical libertarian feminists. They said that we shouldn't really impose lesbianism on women because you might make women feel abnormal if they enjoy heterosexual sexual acts. Uh, and uh, I mean, this opens up the question, what does it mean to be a true feminist after all? And this question is raised in the play by the, by the characters, which is, again, very important. Now moving on, uh, for radical cultural feminists, uh, to be a true feminist, you have to be a lesbian. Again, very controversial. Uh, for them, uh, lesbianism is something that comes naturally. Of course, this is not the same, and this is not what holds for more, many women. They introduce monogamous lesbianism as the only good sex for women. Why? Because they say that essentially, female sexuality is better than male sexuality. Male sexuality is essentially um, even potentially lethal. Uh, when Jean says uh, to Pity, no, but you said you wish Taylor was into girls, so you could treat her right. You're able to see the way her boyfriend mistreats her because you're not blinded by attraction like she is. She basically uh, makes a distinction between, uh, between feeling attracted and between using your sexual desire to uh, go against the patriarchal system and basically create a protest. Uh, so there's the idea that only women can give each other a new sense of self. Okay. Now, onto the term feminazism, which I think is very, uh, very important. I mean, I wanted to learn more about it. This person right here is uh, Rush Limbaugh. He, uh, he was the first who introduced the term feminazis. Uh, he's a conservative political commentator, and he, uh, the, this term emerged in his book in 1992. According to him, a feminist is a woman to whom the most important thing in life is seeing to it that as many abortions as possible are performed. So basically, he kind of creates a parallelism between women who want to gain control of the reproductive systems with being a Nazi and creating a modern day Holocaust. I think you can see that there is no correlation here. Um, now, Charlotte Proudman, which is a barrister that is an English lawyer, she wrote uh, on, in The Guardian uh, as a defense on feminazis because she herself was called actually a feminazi. She said that the term feminazi is basically a way to silence women because basically stigmatize them. This is how it was used in the media, in the play. Um, it's also used to defend abuse and oppression over women. I quote, they, and she means the users of the term feminazi, define harm inflicted on women as a significant or fictitious. As it is as if you're saying that rape is not important. Uh, it also gives a moral obligation on feminists to distinguish themselves from Nazism, as if feminists do not already have enough prejudice to work with. Okay, now, feminazism in the play, we see that, that the girls actually use the term feminazi uh, to describe what they're doing, and even the play writer, uh, she describes the group as a feminazi five. Marie says, I've never thought I'd say this, but the term feminazi might actually be accurate. We're a group of women that sterilizes men. We're like running a eugenics program. So uh, what I see here is that the feminazi five gives a different meaning to the term feminazi, and they seem to bear the badge with pride. And let me explain what I mean here. I do not mean that they take the term feminazi as it is being used by the media, which has a lot of negative connotations, and they say, oh yes, I'm a feminazi. What they do instead is that they reverse the negative connotations that the term feminazi comes with and they use it as a weapon because for them, what is important is that they take the term feminazi and they say that, well, I'm doing something radical. I'm doing something radical as a means to go against the system, but also as a way to do the greater good for women because what they're doing is good for women in general, not for themselves. 
Um, there's also criticism on the phony protection that women have in society, that is on the surface level, women are, you know, uh, as, I, mean, I mean, they look as if they are protected, in reality they're not. Uh, and they also want to regain control over the sexuality and reproductive systems. Now, um, feminism again opens up the question of assumptions, of certain assumptions that um, are prevalent nowadays, especially when it comes to being a feminist. Um, and these assumptions are challenged within the play. As we can see here, Marie talks with Natasha while Marie is getting an abortion. She says, I never heard about that. When I hear about feminists from back then, it's all crazy, bra burning, man hating, and Natasha says, but hairy lesbians, chuckles. His story, well, her story is easily lost. Now we see that here, these assumptions that, you know, that people have, and even women have about other feminists, especially nowadays. And Tori Moy wrote in her essay, uh, basically in her essay, she wanted to look into how the disconnection of the word feminism with freedom comes, has been brought about. And I mean, here, I mean, nowadays, women feel very reluctant to call themselves feminists because they might be called, you know, crazy or they, they demand things that they should have been demanding. Basically, feminism nowadays has lost this historicity and to what it was, it was used to be connected with. So, she, I quote from her, the result is a situation with today. Feminism has been turned into the unspeakable F word, not just among students, but in the media too. I mean, this is what we see anyway, nowadays. If you have watched the play, you will understand that there are a lot of limitations. What they're doing is very radical. So, uh, Jinx here says, feminazi would be a fair term if we were feminists running the Jinx program. So, I mean, clear criticism. I mean, she doesn't believe that uh, they should be called feminists, which is kind of ironic because what they're doing is very radically feminist. And Petey says, also, I love how you're more bothered by being called a feminist than by being called a Nazi jinx. You know, clear criticism towards jinx and how authoritarian she is. So, there is tension among the feminazi five. Jinx uh, calls the shots, basically. She is the one who can tell, I mean, what the girls are going to do in the group, and she keeps power relations within the group. So what she does is that she feminizes patriarchal power and hierarchy instead of abolishing it. And she forms alliances with the system she seeks to stabilize. As we find out, she is a streaker, and she sells um, the castration videos to pornographers to secure money for legal protection. Now, this is a quotation where PD uh, finds out about all these things about Jinx. She confronts her. She says, you know, you have been lying to us. And Jinx, in you know, an attempt to basically defend herself, she says that she wasn't lying. She says, you can't fight power without any of your own. You can't get that power if you're all about purity politics. If we were in a place of power already, we would, we could make our own rules. Until we reach that place, we compromise. Now, this is a very controversial issue. Uh, but of course, she has to, uh, go against and betray your system of beliefs in order to be able to, you know, um, make what they're doing possible. Now, lastly, um, this opens up the question of who can be called a feminist after all. Again, a question that's been raised in the play. Um, this, uh, basically, we are invited, or how understood it, we are invited to keep a critical engagement with the play like PD. Pity is always self-reflexive. She goes against the authoritarian beliefs of genes. She is able to think more critically, uh, and um, we should keep in mind that this place to raise awareness, not to give a solution you know, to rape and to rape culture. And for me, the climax of the dehotomy comes when genes prevents the other girls from stopping Pity from strangling her high school crushes rapists. So they were not supposed to kill rapists, they were supposed to castrate them. They're also not supposed to let emotional interests come into play. Uh, and when Jinx and the other girls see Petey strangling uh, her high school crush's boyfriend and rape, uh, sorry, not boyfriend, rapist, um, Jinx prevents the other girls from stopping her, which of course, you know, leads to the point that Jinx wanted Petey out of the group. And now the question arises, was it because Petey could no longer handle their mission professionally, or was it because she stood up to Jinx and dared to question the leader's authoritative system of beliefs? This is not the question that you're gonna answer right now, it's just, it's just to, you know, that's why we're excited and... Um... Uh, hi, I'm Andrea. Uh, I am also presenting on Jinx. And I'm following Nabana's discussion. She has discussed how the play depicts the violence of women towards men, rapists. And I'm going to discuss.
discuss the opposite side of this violence, which is also what initiated women's rage and violence in the first place. The title of the presentation is Sexual Violence Towards Women, and more specifically, the issue of rape. Uh, here is my outline. I am going to refer to some theoretical uh, views of radical cultural feminists on sexual oppression. Then I'm going to discuss the normalization of male sexual violence, violence and how it is depicted in the play. Then the effects of rape on victims as they are presented in the play as well. Uh, I am going to tackle the issue of silence of rape victims and the breaking of the silence, which is kind of manifested in the play as well. Then I'm going to tackle the issue of social reaction, the media and the legal system towards the castration group. And then we, are, we, have organized, we have prepared a question and a re reflection activity for you to discuss. So, first of all, uh, radical feminists generally emphasize that women share a common experience of male oppression, and more specifically, their primary concerns involve issues about women's sexuality. However, in my presentation, I will specifically focus on radical cultural views, as radical, radical libertarian views are usually quite different. As Hong notes, Radical culture of feminists claim that sexuality is a primary locus of male power. She also presents radical cultural's view that feminists should repudiate any sexual practice that supports or normalizes male sexual violence. So we understand that the male sexual violence is the main target against which radical cultural uh, feminists fight. So, uh, moving on to specifically the issue of rape. Uh, rape is the most characteristic example of male sexual violence, of male sexual oppression against women. It is a kind of violence enacted in women's intimate sphere, and according to radical culturals, it is the ultimate expression of male violence. According to Robin Morgan, a radical cultural feminist, rape is the perfected act of male sexuality in a patriarchal culture. It is the ultimate metaphor for domination, violence, subjugation, and possession. Pulling up the discussion of rape as an ultimate form of violence, Hellingwood notes the following. While any form of violent attack may have severe emotional consequences for its victims, the sexualization of violence in rape greatly intensifies those consequences for women in Western societies. Another crucial aspect of rape is the silence of rape victims, which is a common phenomenon as it is reinforced by the legal system and maintained by society. I will return to the issue of silence in a while and, not, and how it is manifested throughout the play So, I will begin my discussion of the play by referring to the concept of rape culture, in which women are objectified and held responsible for sexual assaults against them. Touching upon the concept of rape culture and the common phenomenon of victim blame in Houdini, Marta Rossian claimed the following. Uh, making women's behavior and identity a site of rape prevention only mirrors a dominant culture's proclivity to see rape as a women's problem, both in the sense of a problem women should solve and one that they cause. Uh, the social concept of rape culture is manifested throughout the play, but I chose to provide you with the following quotation. Marie, talking about rapists, says that people think these creeps only exist on the internet or on the news, but they live in our fucking houses. <coughs> they go to school with us. They go to church. This shows how generally, how greatly incorporated rape is within society and has indeed eventually become an integral part of culture. Uh, next, I am going to talk about the normalization of male sexual violence and how it is presented in different instances in the play itself. Uh, first of all, a way in which male sexual violence is normalized is through the demand of men and the entitlement they may sometimes feel they have to control women's sexuality. This is exactly what happens, for example, in the case of Piggy, this a lesbian teenage girl whose rapist and male best friend rapes her in order to fix her sexuality. Another way in which this normalization is enacted is by normalizing rapists and their actions. This tendency is evident in the play, in the dialogue between the women, in which James condemns that rapists don't, be, don't fear getting caught, about which Amy replies that maybe it's because it's so normal for men to rape women. And Piggy adds that nobody really questions it anymore. An additional way in which male sexual violence is normalized is pornography. Marie, the child porn star survivor, touches upon that when she says that many child molesters groom their victims by exposing them to porn to normalize their abuse and to teach them how to act sexually. This close relationship between rape and pornography is generally foregrounded by radical cultural feminists who condemn pornography as a visual propaganda of rape. 
Robin Morgan, the cultural, uh, radical cultural feminist I referred to previously, um, highlights the organic connection between rape and pornography and states that pornography is the theory and rape is the practice. Then by practice, she means the practice of normalizing male sexual violence towards women. So, continuing with the effects of rape on victims and how this is shown in the play, um, a major effect of rape is the financial impoverishment in which victims find themselves and their subsequent vulnerability. For example, rape caused Pete's homelessness because of which he became an easy target for Jesus manipulation. Another common effect of rape is a deep psychological trauma it marks on its victims, as well as the feelings of powerlessness. Some of the rape victims in the play have commented on their trauma and the nightmares rape caused them, as well as their feelings of impotence in the hands of their rapists. Another common effect of rape is the embarrassment, shame, and self-blaming they experience. Yes, uh, self-blaming is an extremely common characteristic of victims' psychology, which, according to Mardorsian, occurs systematically, whether the victim fought back or no, whether the rape occurred or was thwarted. This tendency of victims for self-blaming is noted by Marie when she says that it's not fair that these creeps get to walk around with no shame while well, we have to feel dirty the rest of our lives, apologizing for everything like we're the guilty ones. Another effect of rape is the social stigmatization of the victims, which is one of the main reasons why they remain silent about it. So, Continuing, um, I will talk of the issue of the silence of rape victims and how the play enacts the breaking of the silence at some point. Uh, the silence, um, um, so, uh, the silence of rape victims comes in two ways. On the one hand, rape victims are silent because of the fear of judgment and their embarrassment, and on the other hand, victims are silenced by the system uh, itself and its indifference and failure to come up rape. I will return to this issue shortly. This silence among rape victims is a characteristic present in the play because women confess their silence about it, but only after they reveal and share their experience. The moment in the play in which the silence is broken is when Peter reveals her experience to, to Taylor, which encourages Taylor to share her own traumatic experience of rape. This sharing becomes a source of solace and understanding. Characteristically, Taylor says to Piggy, since you graciously opened up about your trauma, I'd like to share some of my own if you want to hear it. I think you'd understand. So moving on, uh, another final but very important and interesting aspect of the play I would like to discuss is the reaction of society, the media, as well as the treatment of the legal system. First of all, the play devotes a whole scene in which social, social reaction and the coverage of the media follow the actions of the castration group. What we understand is that there is an extremely intense social reaction against those women. As far as the media are concerned, they attempt to cover the events vigorously and they crucially highlight the brutality of the women in their actions. We are also aware that the police also gets increasingly mobilized in an attempt to find the women. Characteristically, the chief of the police announces to implore them and anyone who wants justice served to a sexual predator to report that predator to the police. That's what we're here for. We have served this community loyally. The first thing worth noting here is that the phrase sexual predator, instead of referring to rapists, not refers to the women of the castration group, so, it is a, so there is a reversal of the use of the words victim and sexual predator. The second thing that should strike us is the chief's claim that the police has served the community loyally because it hides, with, it hides within it a subtle but crucial irony. This is because of the fact that now, in the case of the sexual abuse of the men, everyone gets increasingly concerned and mobilized and it is perceived and communicated as a major scandal. However, in the many repeated cases of rape against women, there is no such concern or mobilization. This reveals a deeply rooted biased treatment of sexual violence, both by society and by the legal system. So, uh, expanding more on the bias of the legal system, um, I would like to highlight its actual failure to combat, effectively combat rape. This failure is highlighted in the play itself several times, especially towards the end of it, where it becomes a pressing matter. An instance where this is manifested is, for example, is a news report uh, which states that some men confessed to having committed rape before they were castrated. None of these men have ever been charged with, charged with rape. The failure of the legal system to prevent rape is also implied in the following conversation in which alternatives to castration are discussed. 
Some of them replies that I heard once that very few rapists ever see a day in prison or even get reported. This reply not only shows how indifferent the system is when it comes to the issue of rapists, but it also highlights the silence of the victims, which is partly caused as a result of that indifference and negligence. Finally, the deeply rooted bias of the legal system against rape victims is dramatically enacted <laughs> and reinforced in the final scene of the play, in which Phoebe, after she eventually kills Taylor's rapist, is abandoned by Jinx and the others, and she faces the legal consequences. When she's confronted by the prosecutor, we can clearly see that he exercises psychological violence towards her. He treats her in a very ironic way, he patronizes her, and eventually dismisses her altogether, as he repeatedly refuses to answer her questions. Uh, specifically, he answers, I am the one who asks the questions here, little lady. Furthermore, the legal system pathologizes and criminalizes him, as he calls her, as the prosecutor calls her, a cold-blooded killer and sadistic torturer. Importantly, however, Pity does not passively accept the forceful charges against her, but she uses the systems of apparent apathy and bias in order to criticize it back for its failure. When the prosecutor ironically tells her that there's a legal system in place for a reason, sweetheart, Pity forcefully embeds the system's hypocrisy. She replies the following, the legal system that blames its victims and chooses biased juries and sentences rapists with a slap on the wrist if they get sentenced at all, the legal system that's going to punish me for punishing rapists. And um, this is, uh, we would like to, sh to show a small clip of the final, this final scene I've been discussing of the play, and on which we will focus our discussion. Which was the, the legal system that, that blames victims and chooses biased juries and sentence is rapist with a slap on the wrist if they get sentenced at all. The legal system that's going to punish me for punishing rapists. That's not how it is. You know that's how it is. Because your cops and your judges and your precious legal system didn't stop the rapists in this town. We did. What we did worked. Maybe it was Maybe she was right. I don't know. Maybe it's the brainwashing. The Jinx's question, it's in my head like, like a broken record. I keep imagining if, if not for me, Amy, Marie, Natasha, then who? Nothing else makes sense when I step back and look at it. It's hazy. She created this intricate system, this perfect solution to a problem no one has ever been able to solve. I, I don't know. I can't answer her question. But I think you should. Before you sentence me, I need you to answer this. repeats it three times. What else could have been done? What else could have been done? And what else could have been done? I mean, um, so, okay, we're not going to, uh, no, we we'll have to give the instruction. Uh, we're not going to ask you to um, answer the question because it's kind of difficult, intricate. I mean, even the player does not even know how to answer this question. Instead, we propose an alternative question that is, why couldn't have been done in this way? I mean, why has this approach <coughs> failed? And what we want to do basically is that um, Jinx is connected with the first question. Jinx says that there is no other way that this could have been done. We need something radical. Pity, on the other hand, is connected with the second question. That is, you know, there's some limitations why this couldn't have been done. So well, we're going to create a debate, and we want to basically. So these are some quotations that will help you to basically create your points. This part was going to be Jinx. Uh, you're going to argue that this is the only way this could have been done. This part is going to be pity. Uh, you're going to say that, well, there's some other, I mean, there's some limitations to it. 